Hey, welcome back to You Read John at 120. I am Jeff Cliff, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as a student at the University of Virginia. And this is actually kind of a sub part of the series. Uh, the, these are three videos are going to be about induction and deduction more generally. Um, if you didn't see the last video on mathematical induction, uh, that might be worth a watch. Uh, but this is going to be one of the basic ways of reasoning uh, that you can do. Uh, along with deduction, mathematical induction, and although we're not going to talk about it, abduction as well. And so, uh, induction and inductive arguments uh, are, are going to be ways of reasoning uh, in ways that are not absolutely certain, uh, but nevertheless allow you to uh, come to conclusions or, or come to, uh, I guess, understanding about the, the probability of conclusions uh, in a kind of rigorous way uh, to varying extents. Uh, inductive arguments vary in strength from very sketchy arguments that are just kind of off, off, the, cuff or off the cuff or uh, kind of written on paper napkins or something like that to almost the certainty involved in mathematical induction. Uh, as mentioned in the last video, there is a difference between mathematical induction and induction. Uh, and this, is, this video specifically is about induction rather than mathematical induction. Unfortunately, as described in the last video, these induction and mathematical induction share the word induction in their name. That's just kind of a flaw in our kind of way of describing things. Although they are related, uh, if they are different things, they should probably have more different names. Unfortunately, th these are just the names that we have to talk about them with. Uh, kind of point the fingers at the academics who use these names rather than me. I'd love to have different terms for them. So inductive arguments increase the probability of conclusion uh, based on uh, if the, the two premises are true, then the conclusion is more likely to be true. So let's re write an example ar or argument or argument form. So if we have a premise, something that can be either true or false, another premise, another thing that can be true or false. We can make a conclusion that is more likely to be the case than if these two premises were not true. Again, just to kind of really emphasize this, this part, unlike a deductive argument, which we'll get into next video, this may be false, even if the two premises are true. However, it is likely that it will not be false if you make this argument and if your argument is valid. Likewise, uh, if you view these premises as not just true or false, but a, uh, I guess, probability between, say, 1 and 100 percent, then the conclusion will also be a probability between 0 and 100 percent, but it will be higher than if, or higher than it would be otherwise, or higher than your prior belief in what the conclusion would be. So if your prior belief is 50%, then maybe if P0 and P1 are both true, then it'll be 60%. Something like that. That would be an example of an inductive argument. You cannot get to certainty using regular induction. So you can raise this percentage of your belief in C to a very high degree, maybe 99.99999% or higher, but you cannot get to 100%. You can get to within uh, your error margin of your number system, but again, uh, you can only get arbitrarily close. Uh, you cannot get to certainty using induction alone. Uh, and kind of as per mathematical induction, uh, if you don't have the ability to make a deductive proof, sometimes this is as good as you can get, uh, especially when you're dealing with real data from experiments. Real data that comes to you that may have other factors involved, um, things that you kind of can get your hands on literally uh, and get data from them, uh, or, or kind of positions, uh, weights, uh, temperature, all, all these kinds of things uh, will usually generate data that is a little bit noisy and, and that can give you a, a, a great deal of certainty and ability to predict it and to understand how it works, but you won't be able to get exact results. And so in cases where you're not exact, in cases where you do not have perfect data, 
Induction is usually the best that you can do. Uh, but you can usually do pretty well with it. You can understand a lot about the universe using induction. Uh, science in general is an inductive affair, uh, although there is also deduction involved in it. Um, for a, to a great deal, you can understand almost all of what science is and can accomplish in terms of arguments like these. There are some people who don't believe in the validity of induction and inductive arguments. Uh, those people tend to be uh, not very serious about their beliefs, and they tend to be uh, kind of academics uh, or uh, other such people who, uh, when called on it, can usually uh, kind of disagree with themselves. Uh, but I, I would suggest to not necessarily listen to them. You're going to be guiding a lot of your life on arguments that are not perfect. Uh, this, these kinds of arguments are going to be examples of that, where if this is the best you can do, then it'll guide you at least fairly well. Uh, there may be situations where you can do better, uh, but there's going to be a lot of situations where you can't, and that this is as good as you can possibly do. Here's an example of a mildly strong inductive argument. Quote, every time I've walked by that dog, he hasn't tried to bite you. So the next time I walk by that dog, he won't try to bite me. End quote. So this is going to be an, an example of uh, how you could view So every time is going to involve a couple of kind of trials or a couple of premises. Let's say two. It is not certain that if we just walk by the dog twice, that the n plus one time, we will also, just as we did from the first two, not be bitten by the dog. The dog may have a bad day. Maybe uh, the dog can get rabies in between your walking by it, and it can just completely lose its mind. Maybe you just lucked out in the first two days, and the dog was sleeping, or kind of full from eating the other three people who walked by that day. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways that the conclusion could be false. But nevertheless, every time you kind of encounter the dog that doesn't bite you, uh, it gives more certainty to the next time. Uh, because the, the ways in which the conclusion could be false kind of get narrower and narrower, where each time it is less likely that any of the reasons why the dog could bite you would apply, because again, you're, you're starting to en encounter experience uh, if you're encountering data that kind of informs how you should approach the ability of that dog to bite you. Here's another example. And Socrates is usually used as the prototypical example in these kinds of arguments. Uh, it's just sort of a placeholder, just so you know. So Socrates was Greek. Most Greeks ate fish. Therefore, Socrates ate fish. Now, we don't know exactly what Socrates ate, I don't think. I mean, I, I do remember, uh, I, I th I'm pretty sure Plato mentioned that Socrates drank wine. Uh, and so, there, there's probably evidence that at least at some point in his life he, he actually did in fact drink wine. But I, I, I just don't know, maybe somebody can correct me here, uh, what, what exactly he ate and whether or not he ate fish specifically. However, again, most Greeks, both now and in the past, eat and ate fish. Uh, and so it is likely that, absent evidence from the contrary, that Socrates himself probably was like most Greeks of his time and ate fish. Uh, it is not certain. For all we know, maybe Socrates was a closet vegetarian and didn't even tell people as much uh, and kind of spit out any meat that he did eat under the table while his you know peers that he was eating with were drunk. 
That, that is the sort of thing that could logically happen, but we have no evidence for it. And specifically, it is going by Occam's razor is less likely than the kind of baseline hypothesis that Socrates was like any other Greek of his time, and that he ate fish. Again, go back to the Occam's, ra Occam's razor video if you want more details on that. But in general, uh, if you have an argument like this, where you're, you're, you're looking at a general class of things, uh, and then one person is a member of that general class, then you can assume that this member of this general class with these properties may have this property as well. It is not a certain conclusion, as you may want to go, I think it's the ecological fallacy. Uh, there may be situations where Socrates did not eat fish, and you sh shouldn't assume that he did to a, any degree of certainty. But again, it is likely, since he is a member of that class, that you can assume uh, as much. This is related to uh, other videos, as other things we've talked about. It's related to alchemy. Uh, Francis Bacon, or quote, Francis Bacon is considered the father of inductive, reason, er, inductive scientific reasoning. Galileo had placed great importance upon the mathematical interpretation and experimental verification, but the combination of these methods reached full maturity with Isaac Newton. And so what we owe our understanding of these kinds of arguments to is mostly uh, Newton and his use of them. Uh, it hasn't, we've, we've made a little bit of progress since then, uh, but for the most part, uh, these kinds of arguments were really kind of clarified at that point. Uh, quote, uh, the Royal Society, uh, which Newton was a part of, was new to devising experiment as a means of producing observations. Until Newton's time, they would experiment, they would observe things, and they would confirm and deny hypotheses based on observation, but the loop was open. Uh, making arguments that were not deductive but valid to draw conclusions from dates to Newton. Uh, so again, this is another way of kind of looking at this kind of thing because not only can you make this kind of argument, but you can tie experiment to it and tie the outcomes of your experiments to the ways in which things can be true in the argument itself. And so one of the things that Newton did uh, was that he was very uh, kind of almost obsessed with making sure that anything that he made an argument for, he had a, an experiment to go along with it, so that if the experiment turned out to be false, then again, the, the conclusion would be less likely. If the experiment turned out to be true, then the conclusion would be more likely. So that there's a very tight interconnection between experiments you can do and inductive arguments. In this particular case, we can't really do an experiment on Socrates. Socrates is dead, and has been dead for quite some time. But in a lot of things, especially the general principles about how the world works, You'll be able to do experiments, and you'll be able to draw conclusions from them. But the conclusions you'll be able to draw are not going to be necessarily deductive. They're always, or to a great degree, are going to be inductive in nature. And again, we're going to talk about deduction uh, in the next video, so wait for that. Uh, another thing worth pointing out, the first modern scientific journal published the first actual overturning of a scientific theory via a theory along with experiment where the hypothesis was transformed into a demonstrable theory uh, based on inductive principles on 27 April 1676. So this is actually fairly recent. Uh, I mean, we're, we're still going back to Newton and his use of these kinds of arguments, uh, which you can find all about in the book The Last Sorcerer, Isaac Newton. So, uh, It's also related to uh, the optimization system, because a lot of the time you can't have or come up with a perfect or optimal way of dealing with a particular situation, but you can, by inductive reasoning, get pretty close. It's rel related to the 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 video, because uh, a lot of pattern matching involves, again, kind of uncertainty and the use of dealing with that uncertainty via inductive argument. Uh, from all the data, you can come up with the best possible conclusion. Uh, from looking at the Texas Sharpshooter fallacy, these kinds of arguments are often related to the Texas Sharpshooter fallacy because with, with the Texas Sharpshooter fallacy, you're not necessarily using all the data, and your conclusions are only going to be valid in a small subset of the data. If you try to make those conclusions valid for the entire data set, uh, you'll, you're basically making a mistake. So anytime you're constructing an argument like this or reasoning it in an inductive way, you have to be careful that you're not kind of cherry-picking your data or, or 
using the data in a way similar to that kind of mistake. To describe fully the relationship between mathematical and induction, you need something called the degree of support function uh, and measures. Uh, but we're not going there. Uh, those are two advanced topics. But just kind of to point out, there is a relationship between mathematical induction and induction, but it's just a complicated one. So, is there any questions from the audience today? No questions? Okay, well, uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to post them anywhere where this video is posted. Uh, and uh, feel free to kind of make arguments that are not absolutely certain in those comments. Uh, as usual, there should be a Bitcoin donation address at the bottom here available anywhere so that you can fund our whiteboard marker supply. Uh, and uh, we will see you next video.